taking the meeting, meeting for uh, call a meeting to order for um, Monday, December 2nd, 2019, here at the Steel Community Room. And um, the first thing that we'd like to do is approve the agenda. If everybody's looked at it, and there's no more additions or subtractions. I'd entertain a motion to uh, approve the agenda as is. I make a motion to approve the agenda as is. I second that motion. Okay. Uh, if there's no further discussion or changes, everyone who wishes to approve, say aye, please. Aye. aye. Okay. Consent agenda items. Simply uh, the minutes of November 4th meeting and November 12th special town meeting. Well, we dealt with the fire trucks and the uh, Roadside mower. Somebody wishes to uh, make a motion to approve that. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. Okay. Is there a second as well? I'll second that. All right. Moving forward, uh, all those who wish to approve it, please say aye. 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 Okay. And at this time, we have a uh, slot here for the public. Does anybody wish to speak from the public at this point? Okay. Seeing none. We'll jump right along here. Uh, select board items. Consider the request for an article on town meeting warning on climate change. Bill, you want to talk to uh, that a little bit? This is a request okay. from a member of the public. All right. Uh, so it's on the agenda. I think Kathleen Day okay. is here to speak to it. If you'd like to come up to the mic, Kathleen, and uh, talk a little bit about your request. Or you can sit over there. Or you can mic. sit, sure, you can sit there in the chair as well. Thank you. You need to speak right into the microphone, Kathleen. This is the... Uh, wording I came up for the proposed article. And if you like, I can talk more about the background sure. and everything after that. Whereas the climate crisis is real and affects us in Waterbury, as in every part of the world, be it resolved that we will do everything in our power to preserve the earth for future generations by carefully weighing the effect on the environment in all our decisions and actions. Okay, you, you'd like to speak to how you came about this uh, idea and, and uh, request? We we'll yeah. certainly listen to you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I know that town meetings have discussed various resolutions about the climate over the past couple of years. And, uh, after the recent climate strike led by our young people, I was moved to respond to that um, by trying to bring it up here, you know, so that we could discuss it at the Waterbury town meeting, so that we can talk to our neighbors about it, so we can encourage each other, so we can do our part. Um, are you looking for certain goals in mind? at the meeting, or are you just looking for an overall discussion about things that possibly can be done or the way we can change things to maybe make a difference? Yeah, the discussion. I think at this early stage, just the discussion itself, and then we'll see where it goes from there. Yeah. You picked a hard road to hoe, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, just recently, I watched the thing on uh, I was away for a while, so I uh, was able to sit and watch a little bit of what's going on in the rest of the world. And I saw this thing on the news about uh, part of the ocean between Hawaii and the United States where they're mining, preparing to start to mine the bottom of the ocean for these things called nodules. Uh, they're, they're stones, I guess, that have, are loaded with many different types of minerals, valuable minerals, that, uh, that they can use to make electric batteries for, you know, hybrid vehicles and lots of, lots of high-tech uses for these things. And they're naturally uh, created 
on the ocean bottom. Um, but I think the U.S., from what I understand, I kind of caught it in part, that the U.S. has no part of any claim to any of this area that where the bulk of these nodules are located, but there's countries from around the world that have their fingers in the pie on this already, and the biggest concern, one of the biggest concerns, I think it was a treaty that the United States may have signed that prevented them from participating in uh, this process, which would possibly disrupt the bottom of the ocean. Uh, you know, if you think about it, we've already pretty much ruined the rest of the planet. Now we're possibly going to ruin a very small, delicate part of the Earth, or I shouldn't say small, it's large, the bottom of the ocean, where, you know, nobody has explored yet. But uh, I suspect we'll mess that up just like we've messed everything else up. And so that's just one of the issues that, uh, but on the flip side, I saw this other uh, issue where these kids established this um, company that's cleaning up a lot of the pollutants, plastics and stuff that are floating in the ocean and they're really making some headway. So, you know, you got two forces here working against each other to try to, one's trying to make things better. And I, I suppose if the nodules are extracted in a way that is not damaging to that aquatic life way at the bottom of the ocean, which is probably pretty delicate stuff, uh, you know, we possibly might be able to benefit the planet from that as well, but I got my doubts. So it sounds like an interesting topic. Um, somebody wants to, else wants to speak to it, you're more than welcome. I see we got some people here from the public that may be interested in it as well. Yeah, I, I would like to say that it is. Can response. you speak at, at the mic, please? Mrs. Bueller, come up, please. Come up to the mic, please. deterioration of the climate and all the effects it's having on uh, the world and certainly us uh, in Waterbury uh, is the responsibility of each of us. And I just think that bringing it up at uh, a town meeting uh, and making it real, it's not just scientists out there in the UN conference uh, that's happening now that's talking about it. It's, it's something we have to do. And, um, and, the, and there will be people at the town meeting and uh, they uh, can take, hopefully take it per personally and they can then talk to people who aren't there at the town meeting. But we all have a responsibility to do something. To do something. So, that's what I yeah. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, a couple things. So, I think one of the first questions the select board should have to decide is are you going to allow this article or something like it to be on the warning um, just at this request, or are you going to require a petition? Now, they're not asking for money, and I'm, I'm not here to to say you need to make them get a petition, but typically that's how articles get on the warning. This one is not requesting money. Um, if you're going to allow it on without a petition, I would, you know, when is it that the warning has to be signed? The end of January? End of January. So there's time, and if you're not gonna require a petition, I wonder if you would allow staff to work with Kathleen and others about what the language is. And then the bigger question, if you can you just read it again for these <coughs> kicks. Well, as the climate crisis is real and affects us in Waterbury, as in every part of the world, be it resolved that we will do everything in our power to preserve the earth for future generations by carefully weighing the effect on the environment in all our decisions and actions. Okay, so I'm in support of that philosophy. I agree with what was just said that it's our all of our responsibility. But the we that this resolution is speaking to is the we, the town of Waterbury. So my question is, if it passes, in this form especially, 
who gets to decide whether we're doing everything we can do to save the planet? When it comes time to buy a vehicle, if there's a, a plug-in electric uh, dump truck that costs $200,000, do we have to buy that because we've passed this resolution? So I'm just a little concerned about who gets to make the decision about what we do as a collective town. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, when, when the vehicle that I drive was purchased the, the last time, <coughs> back in 2009, um, the select board pushed for <coughs> a hybrid. <coughs> that, there was no, <coughs> no good alternative for a, a straight electric vehicle. So they, the select board, suggested a hybrid. And you know, I did a lot of research. I came back to the board and said, this is how much it's going to cost. This is the premium that we're paying. This is the gasoline that I expect that we'll save. Uh, you know, I didn't pretend to be able to tell how much carbon would be put in the air. Somebody could make that calculation, but not me. But that was something that was good. And we did exactly what the resolution is asking. We carefully considered it. And ultimately, the board decided to spend some more money up front to do something that they felt was the right thing. But I'm a little concerned about a broad statement that says, we're going to do everything that we can. And where does that put the town? Who makes that decision? What the everything <clears throat> is? Bill, you took some of the words out of my mouth. Um, I'm somewhat against this proposal. As much as um, I do believe in climate change, I do believe a discussion at town meetings uh, is appropriate. I think it's more appropriate uh, under other business versus a binding resolution. I think climate change affects our state, our nation, in a lot broader ways versus we as in the town of Waterbury, if we would do everything we could for climate change, we would have such a negligible effect if our, if our state, our country, and the rest of the world did nothing. Um, I do think, I, this is where I agree with Bill, we voted on a fire truck. Um, if, if I think what your resolution kind of states that if we were doing everything, if, we, if there was a million dollar uh, electric or you know hydrogen fire truck available that would bind us to purchase something like that at, at a great expense to the taxpayer which I don't know if everyone is, is, is for I think there are a lot of unintended consequences so I do think a lot of the quote um, referendum type requests that are before many towns to be honest, I don't think they have a lot of credence. You know, it's not town, it's, it is town business, but it's not town business. And I would be against, I would be for a discussion, but I would be for any kind of binding resolution that binds this board and the um, town manager to do things that might be not in the best interest of war. Yeah, to, to Mike's point, um, there is a provision, and it's been held up by the Supreme Court, that says that the select board may reject uh, a petition for a warning if it does not have to do with town business. Uh, a number of years ago, somebody presented a, an article to the select board and it had to do with abortion. And I can't remember if it was, you know, to, to pro-life or, 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 or not. Um, you know, or pro-choice. But the fact was that the select board consulted an attorney, and the attorney said, well, this isn't an issue that the town can do anything about. It's not town business. Therefore, you should not put it on the warning, and, and you should not vote on it, because the town couldn't bind itself to do anything. We don't have the authority to do it. In this instance, however, I think the, the resolution or the the you know, the whereas is something the town can do if they wanted to. So I think it is town business. I think the way it's written right now, it's too broad for 
from my uh, uh, personal sensibilities, and not because I don't agree with the, the, that the issue is serious, it's just I'm concerned that it's too broadly stated and somebody could come in to a meeting and say, hey, you're not doing everything and we voted at town meeting that you need to do everything. So I would like to suggest to the folks who feel this is important, you know, I'd be happy to try to work with you to get um, a resolution or an article uh, and a motion that, that makes sense, but this one I'm just concerned is too broad. So that goes back to the beginning. If this one is, uh, is what needs to be proposed from Kathleen's perspective and other people, then you have to decide whether you're going to just accept it and put it on the warning or if you're going to make them get a petition. But anyway. So I just uh, wrote something to get the discussion started. You know, it's not written in stone or anything in my mind at all. Um, I want, I don't think it should be just left for somebody to bring up at the town meeting under other business because that doesn't seem to work. I think it needs to say something about the climate, you know, in an article so that the discussion will take place without any, you know, procedural problems at the end. <coughs> and. Um, you know, so I made, it, I made it strong so that we could, you know, modify it back to what's reasonable. So I'm happy to do that. Yeah. So if, if you're willing to work in the folks in the room, then... Come on up, Duncan. <laughs> uh, Duncan McKeever. Uh, and uh, I am in support of having some article. Um, I take Bill's point. Uh, that the way it is currently written, uh, where the town would need to do everything it can, makes it difficult for the town to decide exactly what that might be and may force it to do things that are not in the town's interest. On the other hand, I think it is absolutely town business. I think the actions that we take as a town <coughs> affect our world. Um, I think climate change is the most important issue facing our society, uh, facing our world right now. And um, I've served with Mike on the Conservation Commission. I know how much he cares about the natural environment. Mm -hmm. um, but when I hear folks say, this issue is too big, other countries aren't doing enough, other people aren't doing enough, so if we do anything, it's a drop in the bucket. To me, that's almost like a group of people in a boat that's sinking and looking around and saying, well, other people aren't bailing, so I'm not going to start bailing. <coughs> the boat's going to sink. And I think all of us need to start bailing. And if not everyone does, hopefully when they see the rest of us bailing, they will start as well. And I think every little bit counts. We really don't know what's going to tip it one way or the other. And it may be that we've gone past the tipping point and our actions at least reduce the impact that's going to take place on our children and our grandchildren. Um, this is a huge, huge issue. It needs to be dealt with at the local level and perhaps a wording of um, you know, uh, our town needs to take into account or needs to consider um, issues related to climate change or something along those lines as opposed to must do everything it can. Um, something along those lines. Um, I think all of us uh, need to keep climate change in mind. Um, I was involved in helping to craft the um, energy plan uh, for the library uh, town plan. And um, I truly believe that, that we have a lot of great um, steps that we could take, but I um, reiterate something I've said before, and that is that we really need a group of people in town to drive that forward. There are a lot of great um, action items, and really very few of them are gonna take place unless we have individuals from different parts of the town, from um, you know, the municipality, from Waterbury League, from Revitalizing Waterbury City, getting together once a quarter and saying, all right, here are the 30 or 40 action items we listed. Which ones are we going to move forward on? And it's, a, to a certain extent, the kind of thing that the select board and the planning commission uh, also need to bear in mind is, you know, every once in a while thinking about what can we do? Um, because there are lots of things our town can do. And we're just, everyone's busy. You are, you are flat out busy. Everyone else is busy. And if you don't have it front of mind, it's just going to pass by. So this needs to be something that's thought about every time significant issues are, are considered 
at the select board level, at the planning commission level, and other leadership level. So it doesn't need to be everything you have to do because, again, that could lead you down the path of, well, we need to invest $2 million to do something. But it should be considered. It should be a serious consideration for, for all the major issues that we're taking in mind. Yeah. I'd be much more for this if when we saw a recrafted um, resolution that didn't wasn't so all-encompassing because that seemed to be like everything or, or nothing. So I don't know if I could vote in the affirmative for the, re the resolution as presented. Could I? Could I sure. revise it? How about this? Well, I think I think we should continue to talk about the idea of whether we move forward with. I don't, I don't think we should get specific tonight. I think right. that's the mistake we can make tonight. Um, I guess I'll, sorry, I don't mean to jump in, but um, I, I think it's a great idea. Um, but I think that we should let Bill and the staff work on rewording it outside of this meeting and re-present it to the board. Um, I fully support everything you said, so I, I think it's, I think every decision we make, there should be consideration on what uh, impact uh, the decisions we're making as a town on climate change are, so I think that Something along those lines is where I'd like to see it go, um, and then whatever bill comes up with, and and the, and the staff. So, I, I support it. I just think that we shouldn't try to get specific to what the article will be tonight. I think that's a, that's something we shouldn't try to do tonight. Yes, um, I just wanted to mention that uh, our young people are le are the leaders, and um, in this inspiring the adults and the older generation to step up to the plate around the world. And, and if you have an opportunity to look at the article in the bridge, uh, October 12th through 15th of this year, where they had the, the uh, climate crisis action strike in Montpelier and around the world, and everybody stepped up and, and uh, attempted to make some kind of pledge to themselves or information to the community. And one of the things that the people here, young people here in Vermont asked is if we could put something on the town meeting uh, agendas about the climate crisis and some type of activity that everyone could think about. And I really appreciate and support that opportunity. Uh, I do believe that not to box the, the town into buying something that is extravagant, but to evaluate the criteria based on what is available, to do what you can, not what you, is some step beyond, like the young boy or girl, I think, I think it was the young boy who um, took the steps to do away with plastic straws. So now we have paper straws, and they're recyclable. And Vermont, as a small little state, has done a lot of uh, groundbreaking things through the generations. And I think this is a really uh, a good, big leap that can be done in small portions, and I would really have a lot of support, whether in, in many ways that we could do in our little community. So we appreciate any efforts that way, whether they be little or big. It's, it's whatever little thing we can do. Some people can't do as much as others. Some people use a paper bag compared to a plastic bag. So. Unfortunately, in my eyes, and being in the business that I'm in, I'm very cognizant of what's going on on the planet every day, even though it may not seem like it because I'm in the type of business that I'm in. But that makes me more aware of actually what's going on, and it's to some degree frightening. Um, it seems like the acceleration rate of the uh, problem, uh, and in a lot of people's eyes, there is no problem. Uh, is is 
the acceleration rate of the problem is faster than our efforts to curb it. And I see it, I see it all the time. So it's worth having, certainly having a good, good discussion about it. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Bill April, Waterbury Sun. And I want to uh, speak out in support of the statement, but unfortunately we want to uh, uh, rewrite the statement so it makes more economic sense for this board and for future boards. But we want to make a point of, uh, back in the 90s, there was a woman down in Brattleboro who started out a petition on the uh, town agenda, and it was about landmines. Her name was Jody, and I can't think of her last name, but she ended up getting the Nobel Peace Prize. Okay? So no step is too small. And I want to just make that point that no step is too small. A statement is a statement. It's a, it should be a goal of this town to do what we can. We have I've read the, uh, the uh, uh, energy report that we put together. It's a fine report. It's got a lot of work in it. And it's got a lot of uh, potential for it. We want to use that as a, as a, as a key piece of, of uh, town uh, effort and uh, keep it in the, uh, uh, at the forefront of all the, all the actions we do. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. Chris? So, Kathleen, yes. Could I make one final sure. attempt to propose something that maybe we could just pass and then the real discussion will take pla place at town meeting. So the beginning is the same. Whereas the climate crisis is real and affects us in Waterbury as in every part of the world, be it resolved that we will carefully weigh the effect on the environment in all our decisions and actions. Uh, I, I guess I'd have to refer to Bill for that. Um, I, I am with Mark on, on taking a little bit more time to just make sure that we're not uh, handcuffing the municipality in any liable way. Um, we've got time, okay? We've got time to uh, get this on the, on the agenda for town meeting and, and so I would suggest putting and it off as well. It sounds like they're committing not to making you get a petition so, if right. that's, so that's we, the, should we just make a motion that this issue will be on the agenda right or on the warning right and, and then we'll discuss uh, wording in yeah. the near future yeah that would be fine I'll, I'll make that motion don't make me repeat it though <laughs> I'll second that <laughs> second the motion <laughs> okay any further discussion Kathleen no thank you very much okay all those in Thank favor, you. say aye, please. Aye. 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 Thank you all for coming. Yes, Duncan. Can we just ask um, what the timing might be? Are there any particular deadlines for making sure the wording is finalized so we can get on the warning? Well, um, it's... The warning is posted at the end of January. Okay. So, a couple of months. So, I think, you know, a, a reasonable goal would be the maybe by the second week of January, we would have the language that would go to the select board. Uh, if we get it done earlier than that, it's fine, but no later than the second week of January. We meet every Monday in January. Okay. And would the next step be you and the select board brainstorming about wording? Well, I think they're leaving it to, and I, I mean, I'll work with any of you that are interested. I'm not here to say that I'm, I'm the, you know, Thomas Jefferson of this, <laughs> of, of this uh, article. So if anybody is interested, I'll, I'll be certainly willing to have that input. But <coughs> ultimately, I think we just want to make sure that we're not handcuffing us and binding us to something that we can't, you yeah, know, can't deal yeah. with. Right. And, you know, I, I don't think anybody's suggesting that we want it really watered down. We just want it workable. And your last one, I think is a reasonable s step in the right direction. So it may end up being that. And much like Duncan said, you know, wind up with something that's going to create action items mm -hmm. instead of just a broad statement. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've got a lot of action items in the energy plan. So yeah. Good. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again for coming.
Thanks, Kathleen. Thank you very much. No, I, was, I want your original wording. Oh, that's here too. Yeah, you could have that. This is fine. This is your original wording, right? Yeah, it is. That's all I need. Oh, okay. I want to give you the other wording. So I, I, it's okay. I just need the original wording for the minute. Okay. What's that? We're actually on time. Yep. That's a good thing. Let's keep Manager's going. items are next. And uh, starting with a, considering a contract to, with Red Start Natural Resource Management for prepare, preparation for preparation for Emerald Ash Borer Preparedness. <coughs> so that's three times fast. Right. So, um, we put some money into the budget this year, uh, $2,200 to be exact, to, um, to do an inventory map and then develop a plan for uh, ash trees along the municipal rights of way, particularly on uh, streets in the center of the village area and streets around the uh, park in Waterbury Center. Um, Steve's not here tonight, but I think we have about 8% ash trees in, in our forests around here. Um, and there's no way that uh, we can protect all of those trees. Even a, a, a landowner who has, you know, several acres is, would not be able to afford uh, to inoculate all the ash trees. So uh, we had hoped that this project would be uh, well on its way to completion now. And our goal with this plan is to, uh, the, the, the trees have been identified uh, in the areas that I just talked about. And the Regional Planning Commission is in the process of mapping those trees so future folks will know where they are. And the plan is intended to uh, give us some direction as to what we should do. And, uh, the plan could be that, well, there's uh, 15 really healthy ash trees right now. Uh, they should be inoculated and continue that inoculation every other year uh, and try to save those trees. There might be a number of ash trees that are already um, in a state of unhealthiness, not because of the emerald ash borer, but maybe just because they've got uh, compacted roots or they've got some other disease and it might be those trees should be taken down in advance of the emerald ash borer getting in there and giving them a, a place to stay. So the plan is <coughs> still to be written. Uh, we had hoped, <coughs> excuse me, we had hoped that uh, Tom and Dan Sweet, local folks who have Hunger Mountain Forestry, <coughs> would uh, do this plan. But we do have a $2,000 grant from the state, and it's, uh, it's passed through money. It really originates as federal money. And in order to use that federal money, we have to have um, conflict of interest policies, and, and the select board adopts one of those every year. And when we <coughs> sent out the request to um, Tom Sweet about the uh, about doing this plan for us, which earlier in the year he had expected to do. But when he saw the contract language and read about the conflict of interest, he and Dan, who is employed by the town as our assessor, talked about it. And they felt that uh, they could not get around the conflict of interest issue. That, uh, you know, it's a small contract, but they felt that uh, it could be something that would raise a red flag with uh, some of the regulators. So they've told us that they, they're not willing to do the work because they, they don't believe that they can meet the conflict of interest policy that the town has adopted. So Tom recommended Red Star Natural Resource Management. They're out of Bradford, Vermont. They did the work. 
um, <coughs> that we're talking about for the town of Randolph. Uh, we sent them the, uh, the same information that we had given to the, to the suites. And they've proposed uh, doing an EAB Ashbor, Emerald Ashbor preparedness proposal. Uh, but their quote is $3,900 to do the plan. So we've got 2200 in the budget, 2000 of that is grant money. The Regional Planning Commission uh, worked with the local tree committee and have already um, inventoried the trees. The Regional Planning Commission is going to do the mapping for no, no charge to the town. That would leave the town pay for the $3,900 that we need to do to get this plan in place. So my proposal to you is, or my recommendation to you, is that you would authorize this contract uh, for $3,900. Um, they will start soon, and we'll, we'll uh, you know, draw down the $2,000 grant money, and in the end, we'll have to budget another $1,700 in next year's budget for this. Uh, it doesn't seem likely that the grant will be increased. So uh, I think it's important that we get this work done. Um, we're going to get uh, you know, two thirds of it or so uh, paid for through this grant. But I think given <coughs> what is likely to happen with these ash trees, it would be good to have a plan in place that can be implemented uh, in the in the coming years. Bill, is there any redundancy between what the um, <coughs> Regional Planning Commission is doing and what uh, Red Start would be doing? Because it seems like the inventory and stuff would be part of what they would be doing. Yeah, the, the, not, not the inventory's been done. Red Start okay. will not have to do the inventory. They won't so they're assuming the, that. They okay. won't have to do the mapping. They okay. will simply take the inventory and the mapping and then they'll assess the, the okay. trees that have been inventoried and decide what the plan of attack or plan of action should be. Thanks. Um, so there's probably no way that one of the representatives could meet with us and explain a little bit of more, more about what they may or may not suggest that we do, or what parts of this plan well, would consist of. Uh, you know, I have seen towns, some towns, uh, vote to basically eradicate any ash that's in their town, which to me seems a little ridiculous. Right. Well, to try to fight this problem. So, but, uh, um, you know, there's a, there's a. Scope of work, six, six points to the scope of work. Meet with the tree committee to establish goals and objectives. Analyze the roadside ash inventory and data, so it's all already been collected. <coughs> Review uh, two other emerald ash borer preparedness plans that have been developed in other municipalities. Uh, draft the plan meet with the Water Retreat Committee, with the Select Board and General Public to present the draft plan. After those comments, finalize the plan, uh, and then incorporate final ed edits and comments, and then submit the, submit the plan to the municipality. So um, I think that there's, it's a collaborative effort. We're not asking them to do this planning process without any input from us. There will be a time that the select board can have a give and take with them. Um, I think it's also uh, should be remembered that while I hope this isn't the case, um, they, can, they can submit the plan and they can say, this is our best recommendation for a plan. This is what you should do. If the select board says, well, we can't afford that or it doesn't make sense to us, you don't have to implement the plan. There's nothing in the law that says that you have to implement this. But this is an issue that we're going to deal with. These trees, without any, um, any kind of uh, um, intervention, it's likely that a number of these trees will be dying. They'll be in the highway right away, and we'll have to deal with them uh, and <coughs> potentially take them down. And uh, you know, the Cemetery Commission uh, this past fall 
uh, there's a giant ash tree in the in the cemetery, and it probably cost uh, you know three or four thousand dollars to take that tree down if it dies. So they agreed to spend a couple of hundred dollars to inoculate the tree, and they they'll do that. You have to do that inoculation every two years for it to be effective, um, and they felt that. You know, it's worth taking that risk to spend a couple hundred dollars to see if you can keep the tree healthy as opposed to have to spend a whole lot of money to take a dead tree down. So um, it's, it's a small amount of money. We've already agreed to do this. When the budget was put together, we thought that uh, Hunger Mountain Forestry was going to do it. And the $2,200, there was $200 of in-kind uh, expenses that we were going to be bearing, and then we thought that the plan could be written for $2,000. And I think we were kind of getting a hometown discount from the suites. Um, they don't feel they can do the job because of the conflict of interest policy. It's not a whole killing amount of money. It's just, you know, if we're going to have the plan done, it's going to cost a little bit more than we thought out of our own pocket. So if we get this uh, plan done with Red Start and then we do assume some issues that need action with these ash trees, would they be a management company for other contractors that would do the actual work of the remediation or would they be doing this all in-house? No, I think, I, th I don't believe that uh, Red Start is going to do any of their work. They okay. would they would develop the plan. Uh, I think that they're a natural resources management consultant. They're not arborists. They're not going to be taking the trees down. They're not going right. to be inoculating. And <clears throat> they would be simply giving us a plan, and then we would implement it. And we could use, you know, Potter. We could use Fire. We could use uh, Michael Roche. We could use Joe Smith from Norton if we wanted to, you know, uh, to do to do the work. I guess my concern is, and again, it's not so much the money, but again, <laughs> every penny counts. Um, in the past, you know, this state has lost uh, the elm tree. I mean, it's starting to see some come back. Um, butternut trees have been uh, pretty much devastated in the state, and uh, and the beech nut has got a fungus on it that uh, is killing most of the beach, I know where there's a few big, big beach that are still in great shape. Uh, I guess my, my thought is there was no sense of urgency back then when those trees were being affected, but now for some reason the emerald ash borer is coming in and we've got to jump through hoops to try to stop it or, well, I, I or don't, set it back and I don't think that control it. I don't think that we're being asked to jump through hoops to, to stop the emerald ash borer. I think what we're, we're doing is kind of like we talked about on the climate change issue. Try to get some information and education. And nobody's suggesting that we're going to try to save every one of I don't even know how many trees are in the inventory. I didn't look at it. But nobody's going to say that we have to spend all kinds of money to save every ash tree. It's, it's a matter of, we're going to be responsible. I don't know who took the elm trees that were on Main Street and in the village down 50 years ago, but somebody paid a lot of money to take those dead trees down. And if we can do some work and do some relatively inexpensive things to prolong their life or to save a few of them and, and avoid that expense, that's what the issue is. is avoidance of expense, not to, you know, save every ash in, in town. Yeah, that, that, I'll agree that makes, makes good sense. Mark, you look like you wanted to say something. No, I mean, I, I, I think I understand what Bill's saying, and yeah, I, I, I think we should go ahead with the contract. Then you'll make a motion for that, huh? Sure. <laughs> so moved. Okay. Second. Any further discussion? And authorize me to sign it. Yep. Yes. As well. Okay. All those who wish to approve it, say aye. 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 All righty. Pilot post of posting of 
excess payment. Budgeted. I, I didn't think to make a copy of that. I can get it if you need to. Uh, we get a pilot payment from the state um, somewhere in the vicinity of, you know, $280,000. I think we budgeted. $200,000 was deposited into the general fund, and we, we planned to deposit the remaining 82,000. So let's just say the total budget was 282 that we thought we were going to get from pilot. And you know, I I knew going into the budget that the pilot payment would likely be somewhat higher than that. I just didn't know how much higher. So we we uh, budgeted with uh, you know conservatively and and hoped that we would get some additional money. And we did. So for right now, we had uh, a deposit into the general fund. That's been made. I think it was 204000 is ringing a bell. But I can look later if you need it. Um, and then we had planned to put $82,000 into the paving fund. You can see that right now, 98378 has been deposited into the Paving funds, so it's sixteen thousand three hundred and seventy-eight dollars more than we budgeted, and I chose to deposit it into the paving fund as opposed to the general fund because we've talked a lot about paving here and trying to boost what we have. So the deposit has been made. Um, if you flip your uh, page over, however, when you say paving fund, you mean the CIP? Yeah, the paving CIP. So the recreation CIP, and I told you that uh, you know we we budgeted for fifty thousand dollars state grant, which we did not receive, <laughs> and then when we started to get into uh, you know changing the lights on the softball field, we ended up running into some significant expenses because the the system was so out of code that we had to upgrade the the electrical um, feed into the into the park as well as fix the lights. So you can see down on the expenses that we had budgeted thirty five thousand for field improvements. We've spent forty three nine forty seven, and the bulk of that, not all of it, but the bulk of that was for the for the lights on the softball field. Um, the transfer. From the general fund will be thirty thousand to date. Uh, through last month, we had transferred twenty two five from the general fund. The thirty will be transferred in. So the total revenues, if we leave it just as it is right now, will be fifty two thousand nine eighty five. Uh, actually, that's not that's not right. It's only uh, it's only seventy five hundred more than that. So that's. So what I wrote in the memo to you is actually correct. I, I was thinking today, I said, this looks too good to be true, and it is. So the, to the total revenues are going to be about um, 30515 in that fund. And you can see that um, we'll be, we have spent about $62,000. So we're going to be about... Uh, Thirty-six thousand uh, dollars negative in, in terms of revenues over expenses in that fund, and we budgeted to be four thousand dollars over. So, as much as I think the paving fund uh, should have some additional money, I think this excess sixteen thousand three eight three seventy eight should be. Uh, Reapportioned and put it into the recreation CIP, 
will still be underwater in that fund for this year and next year we'll have to make it up somehow, either uh, make it up with a bigger transfer or do less projects. Um, and, uh, uh, but I just wanted to talk to you folks first about it. Uh, the paving fund, if, even if we revert back to the $82,000 that we had proposed to go into that fund, will still be better off than what we thought it was going to be. It's still considerably mm -hmm. underwater, as I told you before. We look at the, the CIPs kind of as a whole when we end up deciding how much we should spend. But uh, even if we only deposit <coughs> 82000 into the paving fund, it will have a, a less a lower negative fund balance than we had budgeted for. So uh, it's your choice. In some senses, it really doesn't make much difference because in the aggregate, the, the funds are going to end up where they are. It's just what it looks like on, on paper. Uh, but, you know, the, the recreation fund is a much smaller fund uh, and, and gets a much smaller annual transfer. And, uh, you know, if we end up with a 30-ish thousand dollar deficit there, um, that's, that's difficult to, to make up because there's really no other options except tax money for that one. So I could have done this and just did it, um, and, and you folks wouldn't have really probably noticed the difference because the paving fund would have said $82,000 just like it had been budgeted for. It's just a matter of where on paper do you want to put this additional $16,000. So I hope we don't have to spend the all evening debating it. It's a paper exercise. I'm all for you, Bill. It really is. <laughs> it's, I think you're doing the right thing. I agree. Yeah, for me, the frustrating part is every time we turn around, we've got something else that's digging into our pocket and taking the funds that... <laughs> well, I mean, you should look at it that we got $16,378 yeah. more than we expected. It's just from the, from which, the which state. pocket we're going right. to put it in yeah. as opposed to... Yep. Yeah. No, I don't. Can you, can you remind me, is the pilot money from rooms... What's the... Is it the 1% and then... the? 30% of the 1% local option tax, yeah. is that? So, so the pilot money is generated by the towns that have local option taxes. So Williston, for example, has a local option, sales tax, probably a room and meals tax, yeah. maybe an alcohol tax. Stowe has a rooms and meals tax. Montpelier, I think. Um, a, a number of towns do. So anyway, um, 70% of the revenues generated in those towns that have local option taxes stay in those towns. It really, it all goes to the state first, but the state sends them back 70% minus a little bit of an administration fee. And then 30% of uh, what's generated in those towns gets put into the state budget and the state uses that 30% to fund the pilot program. In the pilot program, um, the state does not, uh, they're they tax exempt. The buildings are tax exempt. The land is tax exempt. They don't give us anything for the land uh, where buildings are located. Forest and, we get forest and parks money for the, for the state forest lands. But um, so the state complex, uh, <coughs> The state pay, makes their pilot payment based on the insured value of the properties, and then they take that uh, insured value, and then they apply last year's tax rate in every town to that, and that comes up with a number, and then that's discounted. We're still getting probably about 60% of what we would get if the state was actually paying taxes on those buildings, but it's up significantly higher for Waterbury because the state complex is 
almost brand new still. So the insured values of those properties are much higher than it was before uh, Irene happened in 2001. Do you know how many municipalities benefit from pilot? Every municipality that has a building in it. Okay, um, any that has like a state A state building. building. So if there's a state highway garage, yeah, so you get a pilot lot payment. If you got a, a lean-to in the, in the uh, state park, you get a payment I for think that. It was that um, so I don't know. It's not all 251 towns that have right. state buildings in it, but every town that has a building gets some pilot payment. I'm sure that we're second only to Montpelier in the size of our of the pilot payment. Maybe Burlington, but their buildings that they have in Burlington are a lot. They don't get anything for UVM. Yeah. So but for that big state complex that they have on Pearl Street. Yeah. So are you suggesting that as the properties to age and deteriorate that the pilot may go down? Well, it could. I mean, if, they, if they lower the insured values on it, sure, it could go down, but that won't be any time soon. But that happens with your property, too. If you don't maintain your property and it loses value, then our tax goes down. So. you got to think that it's a percentage of pricing, and so inflation potentially pushes right. up yeah. revenues there. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the other, the other side of the equation is that there are more towns that have local option taxes and despite what everybody says the revenue that they generate every year the, the sales go up the tax revenue goes up we're still you know not saying that it's an easy decision to to do it i think that there's the challenges for the local option tax are on the the business people who run the businesses i i don't think there's a big dampening effect about people shopping. It's just, it's one more thing that a small business person has to, to juggle and, you know, at the end of the quarter they've got to make their, you know, they've got to pay in addition to their mortgage and their, their suppliers, they've got to pay their payroll taxes and potentially this. So it's, it's not, uh, it's, not, we're not here discussing whether we should have one or not. But that's how the pilot payment is made. So if everybody's okay with understanding that, I will move that and uh, when we get into the budget next meeting or next month, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it. Cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Next on the agenda item is considering a resolution allowing municipal regulation of cannabis. Yeah, so the, <coughs> the Vermont League of Cities and Towns um, an organization of which we are a dues-paying member, um, has a legislative uh, policy every year, and they have uh, two staff people that, um, that work very closely in the legislature and act as lobbyists for municipalities. So we all know from the news and from history of the last year or so that um, commercial uh, retail cannabis is, is on the horizon, uh, on the near horizon. Right now, uh, you know, every individual can, can grow their own, have uh, a certain number of plants and, and possess a certain amount of, uh, of the marijuana and they, they can do it for their own use. Uh, they're not allowed right now to sell that uh, except for medicinal purposes and there's a whole separate uh, set of regulations for that. But um, it appears from the discussions going on uh, in the administration now, the, the Scott administration and with the legislative leadership that the um, legislature is likely to take this issue up in 2020. And you can see, if you have the resolution, do you all, all have the resolution in front of you? Did you? No. No. I'm trying to go make copies, I do not. Here, copy that one. Just take a second. 
Yeah, I did read through what the LCT <coughs> sent us. Yeah. <laughs> I sent back an email that probably wasn't very well received, but I got it anyway. <coughs> Well, I don't think VLCT is... I wasn't, I wasn't aiming it at them. I don't think VLT, VLCT is, is taking a stand one way or the other. Um, what, they're, what they're trying to um, educate their membership about is that this is legislation that's likely to pass, and there will be some impacts on local governments, and what they're trying to do is put municipalities uh, in a position where they have some choices. And acting on this resolution is not taking a stand one way or the other as to whether uh, marijuana should be sold or, uh, or in this town or not. Um, but as you can see, now that Carl has passed that out, uh, the 2019-2020 BLCT municipal policy calls for any legislation legalizing commercial cannabis to address the impacts on municipalities, school populations, first responders, municipal regulations, and, and budgets. Um, what this resolution is asking for in a nutshell is for the legislature to write the law in a fashion that allows municipalities to choose whether or not commercial establishments will be allowed in their own town. Um, again, taking no, making no value judgment about whether this should happen or not, that ship seems to have sailed. Um, and what they're asking for is for the cities and towns <coughs> in the state to have the ability to decide for themselves whether or not they want these, um, these retail establishments in their own communities. Uh, as I've said many times before, uh, Vermont is a Dillon's Rule state. We only have the authority to uh, regulate when the state gives us that authority. So if the state writes a law uh, and allows retail uh, sales of cannabis and doesn't enable municipalities to regulate it or to vote not to have it, then municipalities won't have that right. They will not have the right to say you can't do it in, in our town. So the League is asking that as many municipalities as possible, I'm sure they're hoping for a, a full, um, you know, a unanimous vote from municipalities, but they're asking municipalities to approve this resolution uh, and if you go to the resolve part, that the town supports legislation legalizing a taxed and regulated cannabis market only if that legislation adequately addresses all of the aforementioned local considerations and concerns. The town supports a cannabis tax, and these are the numbers evidently that are being talked about. Um, and derived from local cannabis tax retained by the host community of where the retail establishment is, and that 30% pooled and redistributed to municipalities that do not host retail establishments, um, and then um, allowing the municipalities to have an opt-in uh, if they choose to uh, allow these establishments in their town. So right now, towns in Vermont can vote at town meeting whether they want to be a dry town or uh, a wet town. If they don't want to sell alcohol in their communities, they can vote no to having alcohol sold in their communities. Um, you can't say you can't drink here because people can buy it and bring it to their own home, but uh, there are a number of towns um, that do not allow stores or uh, restaurants to, to sell alcohol. And that's really what this resolution is, is asking for. The reason why that they're suggesting number two in the resolved part at the bottom, that the town supports a local cannabis tax of 5%, with 70% of the revenues derived from the local cannabis tax retained by the host community where the retail establishment is, and 30% pooled and redistributed 
redistributed to municipalities that do not host retail establishments, what they're saying is that's the same formula as the pilot payment. It's not for pilot. It would be the 30% would be distributed to communities that don't allow this, the sales. If every community allowed the sales, then they'd all just retain, you know, their 100%, I, I, I guess. But the 30% is uh, a nod to communities that don't sell it, understanding that they're going to have to deal with some of the issues that, that uh, retail marijuana uh, brings. So if it's, you know, um, police, that the police have to be, you know, on the lookout and trained to deal with, uh, with that, um, or if it's concerned about that, uh, you know, they want to educate school children about the, you know, what the impacts of cannabis is. So I'm not the one who, who uh, wrote the resolution. I'm not on the board of VLCT any longer to have any say about this at all. But it's simply asking towns to ask the state to allow them to have a say in their own communities as to whether, whether or not that this will be allowed, uh, a retail establishment will be allowed in, in your town. Bill, so, I don't know if you know this, but why did they go to 5%? Why didn't they just say it matches the state sales tax? I don't know. <laughs> that just seems dumb. Because that's just another thing. Local establishments that will have to sell it will have to have another, you know, you know, calculation on the on their <clears throat> cash registers to calculate a five percent tax versus a you know six per, plus six and a half percent. Yeah, and if you don't if you don't like that part, you can take that out if you want. But um, you could just say the town supports right. um, you know local uh, sales tax. You know, yeah, well, well, as a, it's a sales tax. I don't see you know, that it, it, it may be subject to the sales tax already, Mike. So oh, this, this, this is would be. Yeah, I was going to ask that. This, this is in addition to whatever the state I, would define, I believe right? So, because that's how the. Yeah. The, okay, so you're saying six cents, you know, the sales tax plus five percent on top of. I believe that's what it okay. probably means. Yes. I got you. That a, a tax of five percent. Maybe they should have been clear above the state sales tax or yeah. in addition to the state sales tax. But it's kind of like cigarette taxing. Yeah. <clears throat> so with the municipality choosing, possibly choosing to allow retail sales, what kind of liability is bestowed on the town for, I guess, Making that ruling, is there is there if there is an if there is a liability issue that comes about from them saying, yes, we're going to allow this to happen here. Well, what, I'm not a lawyer. Kind of, I'm not a lawyer, Chris. Yeah. But um, I think the the liability to the town would be uh, almost nothing in that regard. I mean, um, we sell towns that allow alcohol to be sold in their towns aren't. aren't subject to being sued. Maybe, you know, maybe you'll give somebody a good idea. Maybe somebody will sue the town for not being a dry town if they, you know, get a DUI from after buying some uh, booze down at uh, Crossroads. But uh, I don't think liability is an issue for the town. Uh, what the resolution is asking for is that cities and towns must be granted the right to opt in as opposed to opt out. That they want people making a conscious decision that they want this allowed in their community as opposed to it's allowed unless you say no. Um, and that's the difference between opt in and opt out. And that vote would be taken at town meeting? Yeah, if the legislature writes the, not necessarily at the next town meeting, but if the no, legislature... No, but i say that's where the decision yeah, will be made. If the legislature writes the legislation uh, to, as this resolution requests, it would be an opt-in. So if somebody wanted to 
have uh, a business in town, or if the select board just wanted to encourage that sort of business in town, it could be put on the town uh, warning at town meeting and ask the voters to agree to allow it. So, Do we have a tax like this on anything else you can think of? We don't. In Waterbury, no. Um, in, in other towns, they have the 1% local option tax. Sure. I know in uh, some states that uh, the tax has become so horrendous that uh, the keeps, black market keeps the black is market thriving right. very well. Right. And my concern is, like any drug, and this is probably, if you were to put it on a scale of 1 to 10 as far as harmful, it'd probably be down at the lower level now. But as time goes on, everybody's goal is going to be to, like any drug, to increase its potency so they get more business. And before you know it, I guess my concern is before you know it, they'll be putting synthetics, which they already are, I guess, in some cases, uh, creating just a bigger problem. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, we never have the, uh, what's the right word, the tolerance or the uh, capability of managing anything and keeping it under reasonable control. It's, well, uh, that's for right. some people, I, and I can tell you, I just had another friend die of alcoholism. Uh, you know, that's, that's two high school friends that I can think of off the top of my head, and there's, I know, three others that are on their way out. Uh, yeah, but, uh, I mean, that's, that's not because we allow alcohol to be sold. Alcohol is a substance that's, that people can make, and for whatever reason, people like what it does, and some people aren't able to handle it. I think, to, to your point, though, one of the reasons why that the state is going to be regulating, and this has nothing to do with uh, whether we have this opt-in or opt-out issue or whether we can control it or not, but and I'm no expert, but people are suggesting that the best way to have some ability to control, some control the potency yeah. is to allow regulation of it. Yeah. Because the way it is, I mean, people are, you know, uh, they're out there and, and it, you know, they say that it's what you buy on the street now is much more potent than it was back in the 60s and 70s. We all hear of things, you know, synthetics being added to it and everything else. So the, the, the regulating of it is, a little bit of a nod anyway to controlling and, and giving people some comfort about the quality of what they're getting, just like it is with alcohol, you know? Um, you can't buy green alcohol. Because, exactly, in the right. Depression, and people were making alcohol, and it was wood grain alcohol, and people were going blind or dying or whatever. So, anyway, I, I'm not here to speak for marijuana sales or not. I don't use it, it's no skin off my nose one way or the other. It's just, does the town want to uh, take the advice of the LCT and ask the legislature to allow municipalities to have some say in whether it happens in their community or not? That's really the crux of, of the issue. The, the, the taxes are, um, our concern, and, and, and again, if you don't support the, the 5%, if you want to get rid of that Section 2, we can take that out. Uh, to me, it's more the issue of deciding whether we want to have this as a retail establishment opportunity in our community or not. Is this a town meeting type article? I I, well, I this, that's this, something we this might resolution do. isn't. It's this is right. This resolution, right? Not. Well, down the road, if the legislature, if this resolution gets supported by enough cities and towns, and the, and the BLCT is able to bring it before the legislature and say, look, this is what the towns are saying, and if the legislature writes the law, kind of in accord with this, then yes, at some point there would be an article at town meeting town to meeting. see whether we. I mean, it doesn't have to be, but I would assume that somebody's going to want to be 
have a retail business. And if they do, they would come to the select board and say, can we have an article on the town meeting warning and see what the voters say? Because I don't think the four of us could represent totally what the real, uh, I would like to hear from the citizens what they feel like if they want our town to be dry or if they want to be, you know, encourage, you know, you know, retail participation. Right. right. So if there's no more great concern. I mean, I, I, the one thing I don't like, number two, personally, um, I just think if we decided down the road that we might want to put a local tax on it, that's a separate discussion, but I just don't like, I don't like the, establishing a tax that we don't really do in any other market for any other products and then also on top of it the split i just don't i don't i personally don't think that we should support that part of this resolution but um, other than that i think it to get ahead of this and and try to get some power within the local municipality and try to state that um, to the state ahead of of whatever they're going to decide to do, I think is is a pretty important thing. I totally agree. I I, I find that 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 tax part is the sticking point for me. Yeah. Uh, I do totally agree that you know now is our time to be heard, and if we if we want to be heard in the future, rather than just having the state say you will allow cannabis sales. Could I ask you your concern about what's what's driving your concern about the five percent? Just the fact that we're setting a precedent on a on a substance or the sale of a substance when we don't have anything else in our town that is controlled in that way. We're not doing that with alcohol. We're not doing that with cars. We're not doing it with. Are you afraid that it might impact the the business, or it's asking for too much? Back to my point there about other states that are overtaxing it, and therefore the black market surviving very well. Is that is your part of my missed concern. opportunity? What's that? That's part of my concern. Yeah. We don't even know what the, I mean. The state could put a ninety percent tax on this. So how would you word it if you wanted it? I would just changed. eliminate it. Eliminate too. I agree. With Wouldn't that. have it part of the resolution for now. Right. I mean, that is something, obviously, that could come up later. Right. You know, but truth of the matter is we don't have a cannabis dispensary in Waterbury right now. So, you know. So how would you word it to change it? I, would, I think the, I would so would eliminate take, number take two. two out. Oh, oh take the whole two thing completely out. Two out. Yeah. yeah. You just keep the rest. So if somebody wants to make a motion with that change, if there's, unless there's anything else. So if that's the change you want, what I would uh, offer is that I can, um, I can take this out and then you can sign it at the next meeting, as opposed to me trying to go and do this now. So no motion now. Well, I think you can make a motion to yeah, with the change. to approve yeah. this with the change. I'm just suggesting that the signing of it will happen at the next meeting, unless you want to hang around for me to do it now. So moved. I'll second. No further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Who made the motion? Yeah. Nah, and who seconded? I did. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's the snow. I passed out. Mike, could you be sure to turn the camera to the Talk? Yeah, you gotta like talk yeah. right. Okay. okay. You Get it closer. You can <laughs> pull the. Okay. You gotta chew on it, Mike. You can pull the microphone right so it's just a. Bogart the mic, as I said back in the 60s. Okay, next item. I give you a copy. Okay, you have a copy of a uh, proposed amendment to the town's purchasing policy, which was initially adopted in April of 2009. Um, I told you in the memo that I sent out that I was recommending um, changing the $500 um, 
that you have to have a purchase order. If you're a department head, you have to have a purchase order uh, at $500. I told you I was recommending 1000 Today, when I actually wrote this, I thought about it. I said, well, 1200 seems to be a uh, reasonable number to me. Uh, the issue really is that um, the bookkeepers, uh, both Leanne and now Michelle, uh, are real sticklers for the purchase orders. And when department heads come in and you know there's a bill and it's five hundred and three dollars, uh, gets sent back. You need to get a purchase order for it. Five hundred dollars in two thousand nine is not worth you know. It's not the same dollar that it is now. So that's really the big change here. Uh, I changed a little language in the middle section in section three to uh, amplify on that where I said it's understood that the budget in each fund is a, is a spending plan. Overspending and underspending will occur in one or more line items of the budget. The manager shall <coughs> have authority to approve purchases even if the purchases cause the particular line item to be overspent, as opposed to me having to come to you and say, well, we had, you know, $5,000 for new equipment, and now it's, you know, can you please let me make it $5,200? I mean, I, I think it goes on to say if it's significantly higher or if it's there's a particular item that's way higher, that I would come back to the board and talk and receive permission for those expenditures. but. Um, you know, to I, I think that it just the way it's written now in the blue font is more like we actually operate now. Uh, you're not micromanaging me. You're not looking over my shoulder. It just makes the current practice in line with the policy if you adopt it this way. I make a motion to approve the amended. Uh, purchase order requirement uh, policy. Purchase second. I'll second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of saying aye, please do so, please. Aye. 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 Yeah, you're right. Everything costs hundreds today. This one is the, um, if you could sign that one. $500 ain't what it used to be. No, you kidding. Yeah. And uh, to be clear, it says it at the bottom that you're adopting this today, but it will be effective January 1st. So the $500 limit still applies until the end of the year. Thank you. Preliminary discussion on the 2020 budget. Yeah, I don't have anything to uh, to distribute tonight. I don't have a budget to look at. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts right now. Do you have goals? Um, and, and I have, you know, if you say, for instance, that you want the tax rate not to go up at all next year, or you want it to go up by 3%. I'll do my best to do what you're asking for. Um, it will not, um, it will not uh, eliminate the need for us to have budget meetings, and we'll see how close we can get to your goal. But um, I, I'm just wondering, at the moment, uh, we've talked a little bit about paving. We've, we're trying to up our game on that. We may have to borrow next year again in order to do what we want to do. All those kind of things will come out in the details, but um, uh, I just was wondering if, if you had any thoughts, and you don't have to have them tonight. We're going to meet again in uh, December. Um, I may, I'm not promising, but I, I may be able to uh, have a good jump on filling in the, the in effect, non-negotiable line items, the, the items that are going to be what they're going to be, that we don't have any say over to give you a sense as to where things are going. But uh, 
uh, it's time to start thinking about it now, and you can discuss it or make comments now or save them until, you know, the meeting on the, whatever the date is, the 16th, I guess. So. What's your sense, Bill, on keeping a, you know, a, a zero increase in our budget, uh, the possibility the of that? the budget or the tax rate? There's a big difference between well, the budget I, and the I, tax I understand rate. that. Um, level funding the budget is is never an easy thing to do. Right, um, because there are increases. You know, we've got health insurance. We talked about right. you know a couple of meetings ago. Um, equipment uh, uh, and materials go up in costs. There's uh, some expectation that you know wages probably will go up a little bit. So keeping a, a budget. Um, level funded is is a tough task. Yes. If that's what the board wants, then you know I'll I'll do my best to figure out a way to do it and then we can argue about which cuts are appropriate and which are unacceptable. But I think it I think keeping a a, a budget that is completely level funded, Mike, will result in I won't say a loss of uh, cuts in service necessarily, <laughs> but there will be some cuts necessary. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I think that I haven't talked to Dan Sweet at all. Um, you know, I don't think we should expect more than a percent increase in the grant list. If we get more than a percent, that's, that's great. Um, the last couple of years we've been plus or minus that a little bit where, you know, I, I don't see, you know, we haven't had a lot of construction, you know, big commercial construction, the condos up on Blush Hill. Uh, there may be a couple of those that got finished off this year, but most of that has been built out. Uh, we've still got some lots in Waterbury Commons over on Perry Hill. They continue to to sell lots there, and I expect there'll be some development. But uh, you know, we didn't get a new hotel. We didn't have another, you know, building built in Pilgrim Park or anything like that. Uh, and of course, Cured Green Mountain is in the process of trying to sell off properties. So who knows what the values are going to going to do. So I would be comfortable with saying 1% and hope we get it. And if it's more than that, that's great. Any sense of uh, what kind of deficit we're going to be, our shortfall on the budget there for this year, <coughs> if any? I don't think there's going to be a deficit. Um, I think that we're going to be pretty close to where we expect it to be. Um, you know, I, I haven't. When I did the last analysis, we were still showing that we were looking like that our, we were going to have a little bit more on the revenue side than we budgeted, and our spending was going to come in close to what we budgeted. So if that's the case, we may have a small, a small surplus. I, I don't think we're going to be in a big deficit position in, in our operating budget. And how does the uh, Main Street reconstruction project <coughs> impact us? I know we've got a certain percentage there we got to put in. Yeah. Is uh, that going to be new on the tax rate this year, or does that just stay on the no. stay current or stay, you know what I mean, yeah. uh, relative, I guess? Yeah, so um, we're paying for yeah. our share of the Main Street Reconstruction Project out of our infrastructure CIP, and we fund the, all the CIPs get their funding from us from transfers from the general fund or the highway fund. Um, those transfers, we have tried to incrementally raise the transfers every year, understanding that inflation, costs of vehicles go up, costs of paving goes up, cost of paying contractors for bridges go up. So, um, but I, 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 the Main Street project will not require a huge um, investment such that will have a big impact on the tax rate. Uh, even if we had to pay everything in one year, and we don't, we're spending it over the course of at least two years, and 
probably into three. Uh, the local share is in the vicinity of $400,000 and about um, 25 to 30% of that is going to be paid by the utility district in terms of water and sewer. So uh, it's, it's really not going to be a big deal. So I guess my question is more clarified here. If we increased our budget last year to cover that expenditure last year, won't that just stay in the tax rate and also do the same for this year? Or will it? Yeah, I don't think so. Let's just say the transfer to the infrastructure CIP was $250,000. I don't remember what it is, but let's say it was $250,000 last year. I think we might decide to increase the transfer by whatever, the rate of inflation, 2%, 2.5%, just to keep up with inflation, but it won't require more than that. Understand what I'm saying? I was, I was just wondering if, in the, of course I don't remember it, but if the increase, if we had put in an increase to cover that without stealing from the original CIP, if we had put an additional half a penny or a penny and a half or whatever it would have taken to accumulate the hundred and thousand-ish, hundred and, uh, the transfer that they had last year was enough to do what we needed to do last year globally. So Main Street, bridges, uh, culverts, the whole thing. Uh, I don't think, so I think we'll have to increase the transfer or at least uh, all things being equal just to keep up with the rate of inflation and understanding things are gonna cost more over time. We should probably increase it a little bit but it won't take more than that. And if we decide that we really want to hold the line, we'll transfer what we transferred last year, and we may have to trim off some other things that we would have otherwise done, because we know we got to pay for Main Street. Yeah, when I think back to your question on what we'd like to see, I think personally, I think we should always try to not increase the tax rate. So I think that would be my first request, is to see if you can put together together a budget that doesn't increase the rate um, and see where we land. I think specific to paving, I think the one thing that I, I maybe now we're a little late in the game this year, but seeing, I, I don't know um, if we have a true game plan when it comes to a five-year plan, 10-year plan, inventory of roads, conditions, expectations on upcoming investments, where we can spend now to save later, where we are in that. So so, so Alec, and, Alec and Bill Woodruff, the public, well, the municipal engineer and the public works director respectively have been working on that plan and I think probably at the next meeting on the 16th, we can review that. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, and see what their recommendations are, see where, you know, where they feel, you know, we should go. Um, and then, you know, the, the board will either like that plan or not like that plan yep. and, and ask for it to be amended. But I think at the next meeting, we can look at okay. that. Yeah, I, I think I just re really want to understand that just driving around the summer, I got on roads and I'm like, is this that like tipping point where you spend a little now to save a lot later? And I'd like to just understand how we as municipality have a game plan when it comes to those kind of investments that someone might say, well, why are you spending money on this road right now? It doesn't look that bad. And it's like, we're doing it because we don't want to go the other way and end up right. having to dig it up and start from scratch. Yeah. Where are we on costs on the Main Street project? Because I know. I go, to, I go to deer camp with one of the guys who's uh, one of the project managers, and I know they, he's talking about them being ahead of schedule. Mike, so, into the mic. Sorry, is that better? Okay. Um, he said they're ahead, ahead of schedule, which is something that we've all kind of recognized. Uh, are, are costs kind of on track with what they were budgeted for, or yeah. were you going to maybe save a little bit on the whole project? Uh, well, it's too early to say that. Okay. Um, but 
So the town has been, the way that I've worked it with uh, my staff, just for ease of, um, of lots of bookkeeping machinations, is the, the, so every month or so, it's supposed to be every month, the state sends us a bill, and they basically say, uh, McDonald did this much work, and it cost this much, this is what they were paid, and your share is 2% and it equals X. Right. Um, the town has paid that X to the state and we're keeping track of all that and then within the next couple of weeks before the end of the year uh, we've already f figured out uh, what the water and sewer need to pay in terms of um, the uh, plans and specifications. So. What we've done is identify there are certain elements that you can point to and say that's a sewer ex sewer expense. You know, if there's a if there's a manhole being put in at the corner of Elm and Main Street, and that manhole structure itself is twelve thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and then the installation of that manhole is another five thousand dollars. Well, that's a seventeen thousand dollar expense. That's all the sewer and the 2% share of that 17,000 will be paid for by the sewer. So what we've done is identified all of the direct costs for sewer, water, and highway. And then the, the costs that are shared costs. So when we got the, the, uh, the bid tabs from the state, they said, and again, I'm just making numbers up now, mm -hmm. $21 million, um, and it's, um, it's $18, $18 million highway, and it's uh, $2 million water, and it's $1 million sewer. Well, I looked at that, and I said, well, that's great that they've put their bid tabs that way, but that's not right. It's not fair, because all they did was is add up the price per lineal foot of the water main and the sewer main and then the structures and the valves and that was their cost. I said they, they haven't attributed any of the excavation to water and sewer. So I worked with Alec and Bill Woodworth and said we've got to determine how much of this, what the state has allocated to highway, really should be paid for by water and sewer because they can't put their water and sewer mains in without excavating the road and frankly they're going to excavate deeper than we would have had to if they weren't there. So we've worked all that out. So at the end of the at the end of this year the water and sewer will reimburse the town. Now I don't know, I didn't bring a budget with me. I can go and tell you in 10 minutes if you want to know or on the 16th I can give you the full information. Next meeting is fine. But I appreciate that. Yeah. That's very helpful. I well, appreciate the fact that you said oh, that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it clearly, yeah. I understood what they did from a good tab point of view, but, um, you know, they were just assuming that, well, the excavation is going to be done anyway, so that's how they'll split it up. Yeah. But we didn't accept that. So. Mm -hmm. Good. Anyway, um, so is there a general consensus that you'd like to try to keep? a flat tax rate if possible. And well, I, I don't know if that's going to be possible. Yeah, to Mark's point, that's always our first and foremost goal, obviously. Uh, is it realistic? <laughs> Probably well, not. We'll see. You could present this I, I think options. based on the fire trucks and the, in the uh, roadside more that we've kind of well, the, the, the roadside mower is... Well, we haven't committed to the second truck yet, no, no. but there's... The roadside mower is a new item, and there'll be some small impact for that. The fire trucks, it was in the plan to be purchased, you know, next year anyway, and that's really not going to have a big impact one way or the other. Um, well, I'm just suggesting that it's pushed us closer to a point of from there up is starts to create an increase of well some form but we had other debt service that came off the pay the timing on these payments 
changed and or will depend on what fiscal year they'll hit and then turning that into another type of loan right. all make it very low impact on the yeah, potential. And, and, and we were going to have, we were going to have that impact right. anyway because the fire trucks have been on the plan. They were scheduled to be replaced in 2020 and we had to do it a few months earlier but in the grand scheme of things their impact is going to be no different than it was if we bought them in 2020 except we bought the trucks for probably less than we would have been able to buy them had we if they hadn't broken down we'd, we would have been paying $535,000 for them next year as opposed to 465 or whatever 461 okay I just saw the new truck on the interstate for that uh, fire oh yeah yeah. Is there any other items? Did you get that policy? I'll take a motion to adjourn then. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.